How does the ISIS compare to the Soma Pulse, the Earth Pulse, the TDCS, TMS, TENS, or TVEMF? The TVEMF pretty much was solidified by NASA in the late 90s. What ISIS is, is what you get after 20 years of research and refinement beyond okay. that. Okay. Soma Pulse was the product that I had optimized about three or four years ago. That's the one that Bill Pollock still sells as a Soma Pulse. That is, by the way, his trademark. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, we've got to make sure that people know that. I think it's a perfectly great device and, and people still use them. I've got a few of them sitting here. And in fact, we still repair, if somebody bought a Soma Pulse, we still repair the units that. Uh, that people bought from from drpollock.com or somapulse.com. So it's it is the best I could do on that technology three years um, three or four years ago. Right. As far as all the other stuff goes, Earth Pulse and everything, I don't know. Um, I've I've gone through and looked at these things. I think mostly there are people sort of taking a guess at what they think might happen. They might have a lot of anecdotal data. You know, hey, we've had thousands of people use this and it really helped for something. And maybe it did. Maybe it didn't. Um, maybe they used some of the information we put out from NASA 20 years ago and they just sort of were lucky and then they tried a few things and they were sort of lucky. You never know. I've not evaluated them myself. Um, I have evaluated some of their products. And in fact, Bill Pollack wrote a uh, sort of I guess it's kind of a harsh criticism of a product that's no longer available, but um, we tested it for electromagnetic fields and couldn't even measure anything. So all it was just sort of like a flashing LED, and he's got that on his website somewhere. That's just like was this thirty-five dollar thing, and it was so far as I could tell, physically it was nothing. Wow. Um, you get what you. I think I think sort of in the title is you get what you pay for. So if you sort of search Bill Pollock and you get what you pay for, yeah, you, it was nothing. Um, as far as TENS and a lot other electrical simulators are concerned, actually ISIS is more like those than it is like pulsed magnetic fields because at its heart, ISIS is electrical simulation. It's just that it's not electrically conducting like a wire. It's electrically inducting like a transformer through empty space by means of a magnetic field that's changing over time mm -hmm. rather than through a conductor. Why do I do it that way? Because it works and because you don't have to conduct through the skin. The skin will put this huge resistance up. And that's why when you use a tennis ah. system, you have to use all this power and it blasts you and it shocks you and things contract and everything. You have to do that much just to get a little tiny amount of the energy through to where you need it. So it's about 99.9% .9 inefficient, roughly. One part in 10,000 gets where you need it to be. And TDCS so the way that, is the same, right? What's that? TDCS. They're also... It's yeah, anything that's not basically an electrical stimulator that has an electrode that conducts electricity is fundamentally the same. They actually do work. And if you don't mind having somebody cut you open with a scalpel and put electrodes in right on the injury, those will actually work. And there's been about 500 papers published that show that that causes bone regrowth and it causes tissue to regrow. But the problem is it's profoundly invasive. Right. And causes a lot of damage, but but you can actually learn about a lot about those signals and what really works on bone and tendon and everything, and that's all really already baked into the ISIS system. So how does that relate to the magnetic pulse? Well, it's the first time derivative, if you know calculus, not everybody else, but you don't have to know calculus. Because of the calculus of induction, it actually uniformly stimulates all the cells in the volume in which you're applying the magnetic field. So that there is no lightning bolt, it's that every single cell that's in that volume between the coils is getting the same inductive field effect through the electromagnetic induction. It's about 10,000 times more efficient than direct electrical stimulation. And, it's, and, it's, and it spreads that, you know, if you get the stimulus intensity and everything right, it spreads it over 10,000 times more cells than, than direct electrical stimulation. So... Although those electrical simulators still as crude as they are, they still work. If you got something that's ten thousand times more better yeah. and non invasive, why not go with it, right? 100%. That's really the answer. Hundred percent. What do you think of um, a, a static magnet? And yeah. I have done a lot of experiments with static magnets, and this is where I disagree with many people. Like Bill Pollock and I talked about it many times, and Bill said, "Well, you get something called the Hall effect." So the idea there is, yeah, if you have static magnets and there's ions moving through your cells, the you know, positively charged ions will be pulled one direction by the right-hand rule, 
electrons, negatively charged things will go left hand rule, they'll curl, and you can do that with steady magnets. Steady magnets are also known to affect like little tiny magnetized particles that you can find in things like uh, magnetophilic bacteria. So we know they can directly line bacteria up along their magnetic field lines. There are no biological effects of static magnetic field. It's just that when I tested them, and that was one of the things we tested at NASA twice, and one of the things I've subsequently tested many times, in fact, I'm getting ready to do an experiment like that again, with some of my colleagues at NC State, we've never seen a biological effect, oh, not wow. in eukaryotic tissues. So a lot of these steady DC magnetic things, I've never seen an effect. However, I actually believe there could be one. Right. Just because I'm not seeing it doesn't mean it's not there. So I've had a lot of people ask me, can you use ices with a magnet? And most people who do steady magnetic field uh, um, therapies, and there are many people I greatly respect who do them. I just don't know what the mechanism is. I don't, under, I don't, right. I don't know, right? But I do know that physically you could put like a disc magnet right inside the coils from our magnets, make sure you've got the north side facing the tissue, and it would superimpose our signal on top of the DC signal, and you get both. Okay. And I think that could be tremendously effective. And in fact, right now, I'm you know, trying to work on a product to do exactly that. And I got a quote out to a magnet company to see, you know, can they, can they, can they label the north side for me just to so make absolutely sure that people use it the right way? Because using the south pole of the magnet, people tell me, has negative effects. And I wouldn't want anybody to make that mistake. But if somebody wanted to do experiments on that, which I'm doing on myself, uh, they're easy enough to do, and I'd be happy to tell people how to tell them. Interesting. Yeah, it certainly yeah. works really well with our system. It's yeah, physically, I, it's easy to set up. Yeah, um, I actually use a, um, I've been using a static magnet for a few months under my bed. It's 20 okay. gauss, I believe. Um, I just found it helps my sleep pretty pretty much. That's um, what people say. People yeah. say that it does. When, I do the, when I'm doing these experiments, I'm always looking at cells in culture. Right. And I'm never seeing any biological effects. So I've never but, done it you know, really with whole organism, right? right? So things happen in a system that don't happen in individual cells. So it may be having a physiologic effect that you've never seen in a bunch of cells in a dish. You can only see in an actual functioning organism. It's sort of like I could talk to ear cells grown in a dish all day. They don't hear me. They have to be part of a functioning auditory system, right? Same right. thing, right? Maybe a, maybe a fixed magnet is having a biological effect at a system level that you just can't see in culture. Yeah, and I, I, don't, I don't either understand how it works. I'm just like, well, it's just working for me, <laughs> so I'm doing it. That's well, it. Well, that's the most important thing. And you're not going to hurt yourself with, with steady magnets because we yeah. live in a steady magnetic field all the time, half a gauss just from the earth. And that doesn't, you know, we've evolved in that. It doesn't right. seem to hurt anything. What do you think of DIY PM, PEMF devices? So I don't know if you saw, but I actually, uh, one of the guys who's working on the DIY PMF, I actually, to prove that I try to help people, I actually posted uh, on there, they buy my coils, and so my, my you know, business partner gets really upset. Well, they're not buying my devices. And you say, well, I don't care. So I actually posted like how to use it how to use the coils properly on the DIY one. And, um, you know, because one guy was testing it, oh, it doesn't work well. We had the coils stacked wrong. He had them, like, bumpy side to smooth side. You know, you know better than that. But so I, so I responded, and I said, well, you know, first of all, you got to put the coils together. So I'm telling them how to do it right. So if anybody's doubting that I help people at, at no benefit to me, that's proof enough that I'm not, that I, that I am helping people. But also I go on to say, you know, the problem with using our coils in a DIY, where most people just have it coming out of a, like an iPhone, is that an iPhone is actually, its output is uh, filtered for audio range only. So you can only hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. So for lower frequencies, which is most of what we use in ISIS, around two and a half hertz, and then higher frequencies, which are the steep uh, uh, slew rate that you need to have, not a sine wave, but a steeply sharp sort of pulse, those things get filtered out from the iPhone. It's problem number one. Problem number two is, is that the iPhone doesn't have enough power audibly to put out the, the power that you need. So it's sort of like one-tenth of the lowest setting on our device in terms of the power that puts on the magnetic field. And then third, the iPhones are actually set up to expect between four and eight ohms of impedance on your earphones. 
But what you're actually getting is more like one ohm from our coils. Mm. It's you know, less than an ohm, so it's probably overloading the output amplifier. So I'm kind of concerned that people are going to damage their iPhones by plugging these things in. That's actually my concern is that somebody ruin a you know ruin an iPhone. But if it's working for people, I'm all for it, and I'm actually happy to tell them what I think you know would work best and how to use the coils and everything like that. And um, in a way, I kind of wish it worked, you know, so that I could just say, well, then here's how you make the coils. And in fact, I've even thought about trying to optimize the coils for iPhones so that people who wanted to do a DIY, you know, if the coils were designed differently, it would probably work better. I may do that someday. Um, so, yeah. So, you know, more power to them. Go, go, go. Right. Um, but right. there's technical problems. Yeah. What are, um, so if you can just briefly say what the specs are for the lowest, middle, and highest setting, and the X setting? Right. So the specs are the, um, the, the first time derivative of the magnetic field. So as we increase the intensity, what we're really doing is we're increasing the sharpness of how quickly we turn on and then turn off the magnetic field over time. Mm -hmm. So the exact numbers for that are that we found at NASA that we needed to have sort of these magnetic slew rates, these magnetic fields turning on and off pretty sharply. So square waves and, and narrow pulses work. Then we discovered in the studies at Texas A&M in 2007 that that number had to be over 250 to 300 kilogauss per second. Mm -hmm. So it's how quickly you're turning it on. It's not like it has to be 250 kilogauss. It never gets close to that. You're only turning it on for one, one, one hundred millionths of a second. So one ten thousandth of a second. So if you take 250,000 divided by 10,000, you know, you get 25 gauss total. And that's the sort of the minimum. It's not 25 gauss is the minimum, but it's that slope. The minimum slope is 250 kilogauss per second, which I've patented. So nobody can keep it from you, it's, you know, the world can use it, right? right. Um, if a company uses it, they should pay you a royalty, but they never do, so, you know, that's life, right? Anyway, the minimum that works is about 250 kilogauss per second, maybe 300 kilogauss per second. We discovered this in, in what turned out to be a failed experiment because we changed it during the experiment. It started off above that, and then they sort of forced the experiment to change, and we went below that threshold, and the effect vanished. And you actually see traces of this reality all throughout the scientific literature. Well, we built a more powerful magnet and the biological effect vanished. Well, the magnet was more powerful, but the ramp up to the magnetic field was slow enough that the biological effect vanished. So I think I just explained like, why three or 400 papers don't show an effect of, of the magnetic pulses right there. So you do that for the right amount of time at the right slope. So now to answer your question, the lowest power setting is about double that minimum slope. It's about... 650, 700 kilogauss per second. The medium setting is about 100 or 110 kilogauss per second, or 1,000, you know, 1.1 or 1.2 megagauss per second. The high setting is about 1.5 to 1.6 megagauss per second. And the um, highest setting is about 2.2 megagauss per second. And I have patented everything from below, from two from 200 kilogauss per second to 10 million kilogauss per second. So this is what I've patented, and this is what works biologically, mm -hmm. right in there. That's your power settings. So when it's power, what I really mean is how quickly you turn on and off the magnetic field, and then that influences the um, calculus of electromagnetic induction between the coils and the cells. And it has to be in a certain range, or it's too low for the cells to detect it, sub-threshold. Or, on the other end of the spectrum, it seems to be high enough that it causes some discomfort, and it's actually not as effective. So you want to be over the threshold, but not a whole lot much over the threshold. And that seems to be the case. A lot of biological signals are that way. You're either turning on a system or you're not. And once you turn it on, you kind of don't have to do a whole lot more. So in this case, everybody keeps asking for more power, more power, more power. I, I just don't think biologically that that's what you want. And what about the hertz? Um, so what we use yeah. is individual pulses and what I found is most effective is individual positive pulse then some time where it's off then a negative pulse now ISIS is off 99.8% of the time then it'll put a very narrow pulse that's what you hear clicking mm. and do that one full cycle positive weight negative weight before the next positive we do that that's about 
about two and a half full cycles per second. So that's what it is when it turns on. It's two and a half hertz. Okay. So it's actually five pulses per second because you get a positive delay, a negative delay. Oh, that's one full cycle. So that's two pulses make up sort of like a sine wave, positive and negative, that makes up one cycle, just like that. And then uh, you get two and a half of those per second for the first mode. And then the second mode is a short burst at 100 hertz. And then the third mode is a short burst at 100 hertz of a negative polarity. And those are meant to emulate slow twitch and then fast twitch nerves during early development and early musculoskeletal development and growth based on the research that I did years and years ago. So a lot now you're seeing on blogs or people talking about, well, you know, why did Dr. Dennis, you know, just randomly throw in that 100 hertz? Well, that was after many, many years of experimenting. I didn't publish it. I haven't put it in a paper, but it's the result of a lot of experiments. And we, have, we now have a lot of experimental data showing how effective that is, at least in orthopedic stuff. Interesting. Now, um, what are, uh, how many lab studies have you done on it and uh, animal studies? And you mentioned the Alexandria study, but I read that uh, it got cu cut off because of the unrest in Egypt. Can you yeah. just describe what the, you know, some of the results from that study was and just give so, a, a, a concise overview of some yeah. animal studies so we've and the done Alexandria study? A number of studies on cells and culture, and those started with NASA. And by a number, I mean probably, you know, 20 different studies that I've done. Mostly I didn't publish it. Um, the one that we published from NASA, I didn't get credit for that. and I wasn't involved in that. Um, most of them showed no effect. Um, but I sort of kept the ones, okay, well, here's where the effect is. And I keep trying to cut the universe down in half, you know, to get to the things that really help the most. Uh, animal studies, you know, we did a big study at Texas A&M. We did a second study at Texas A&M. Both of those were truncated because of uh, the company that was funding them actually failed. And um, but we got half the data and um, <coughs> done a lot of studies on uh, cells and culture. And um, most of those were negative. And then we did animal studies. And we did our first big animal study was the one on rabbit ulna in, um, in uh at Texas A&M Veterinary School, and that showed us a lot of very interesting things. But the company that was sponsoring that, that actually owned the IP at the time, uh, went out of business um, and was unable to complete those studies. So we um, we did a lot of uh, we got a lot of information from it, though. Um, we I've done a couple of additional very carefully controlled animal studies at a private research lab, um, which does drug and device testing, and those were two very formal studies that were on inflammation, and I have the results from those studies, and I've got the, the key results posted on my webpage, and those um, showed categorically that we do have a dose-response effect, which is one way to debunk something that's not really real, but that when you're above the threshold, you get a very significant reduction in um, inflammation in an animal model, which, which was rats. Um, so I have another study that I've uh, planned and proposed to be funded by the United States Army on spinal cord injury, and I should hear in the next month or two whether or not that will be funded, and that's to test the effect of ISIS on spinal cord injury. But that study hasn't been done yet, but it's been planned, and I'm just waiting for funding for that. Um, as far as human studies are concerned, uh, most of the information we have is from, from informal stuff that where people try it and they use it. So we have thousands of you know people giving feedback on this kind of thing uh, mostly for orthopedic type injuries but for all kinds of stuff that you know like urinary incontinence for example um, lots and lots of use uh, people have used on horses and dogs and veterinary applications with really 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 good results we've had a number of dogs that were spinal cord paralyzed they have deep pain negative spinal cord injury oh, which wow. is the animal's not in pain but they're totally paralyzed they can't move their hind legs and they lose control of their, their bowels, their bladder and, and stuff. So they tend to have fecal and urinary incontinence. And in every case that I'm aware of where we've used it for that kind of an injury in an animal, we've had um, significant recovery in the animal. To some cases where the animal can actually run and jump again. And it takes That's months incredible. for them to, you know, sometimes the animal will have been paralyzed for years. So I reported this to the Army 
uh, last year. And I said, can you give me some money to help me study this in a formal experiment with kind of anecdotal data? And they sent me initially a positive result saying, yeah, this is really interesting. Let's you know, put in a full proposal. So I put in a full proposal in November. And I'm waiting to hear back. Will they be willing? Because it's a half a million dollar study, right? So you know, they got to think about it. If they don't do it, I may just pay for it myself. Um, but this would be great where crowd, you know, sort, you know, crowdfunding would be great. So I'd take the money, put it in, and we'd do that study. And we would know does it or does it not have a positive effect. Um, there's like secondary injury from spinal cord injury, which is all the other things that happen as a result. And then there's the primary injury, primary paralysis. Nobody believes that it should do anything for primary paralysis, but the hope is that it will make some of the secondary injuries like less nasty. But based on what we see with deep pain negative spinal cord injury in dogs, we actually see recovery of function from the primary injury. So there's a chance that when we run this experiment, that we'll actually see some recovery of function, which would be absolutely spectacular. And it's a half a million dollars to do that experiment. But if you were to try to do the same experiment on rats at a university, you know, you'd be in for millions of dollars in many years. But we'll be able we will know the answer in 42 days. You know, we'll spend the money, do the experiment. It's all done to, you know, industrial standards. This is how they test drugs for their effects. Now this hasn't been done yet, but it's all planned and ready to go. Um, and then, of course, we did do a couple of formal things with, with humans. Um, I've got one that we're planning with the North Cave Research Group that's actually um, in uh, Nebraska, believe it or not. And um, that hasn't started yet. But then we did start a human study in Egypt because I had so many friends there who did any facial research. So you kind of wanted me to talk about that. Do you want me to sort of go over what happened there? Uh, just, you know, give the basics of what, so the like, basics what, were, what were you studying and, and what were, what happened? How did the people feel from it? What, you know, so, so yeah. it's a really interesting study and only two people went through, we were supposed to have eight, but then bad things happened. So two people completed the study. The unrest in Egypt. Okay. The unrest yeah. in Egypt caused the study to be terminated. Okay, fine. But we started this study beforehand. It was fully approved and everything. And basically, it was the sort of the, the design of the device, one version before the soma pulse. So it was, you know, five-year-old technology, you know, sort of early ISIS technology. The device looked similar, but but internally it was a little different. So it was kind of like sort of like the medium power setting that ran on a nine volt battery. So here was the experiment. What would happen if a person had major reconstructive craniofacial surgery, which this clinic that I work with, the research lab that I work with in Alexandria, did as a humanitarian thing, basically for free? Could we make the outcomes better for people, um, post-surgical outcome better for people, so they wouldn't have to come in and get corrected again, so they'd heal better? And this is major reconstructive, like replacing bones by, like, you know, like, like, putting new tissue in and bending tissues around and major cutting up a person's face. Probably the most painful type of surgery you could possibly have done. Imagine, you know, tiny cut on your face is painful. This is really, really painful surgery. So they enrolled about eight people and two of them went through and, and here's what we studied and here's the results. Okay. We wanted to know how would it impact pain? How would it impact the quality of healing? as assessed by a separate craniofacial surgeon, and how would it impact the, 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 the speed of healing as assessed also by a separate craniofacial surgeon who was not part of the study. And um, you know, two people who went through, the very interesting result to me was that everything was improved radically. Oh, wow. So they tested it every, at every three weeks. It was like they'd go in and they'd have a clinical assessment, how is their healing? And they have these things called healing milestones, like, okay, at three weeks, you should see this, this, and this, and at six weeks, you should see this, this, and this, and at nine weeks, you should see this, this, and this. And the compelling one was that the healing milestones that people were achieving were always in half the time that you'd expect to see them. So the level of healing that you'd expect to see at six weeks was already happening at, at three weeks. So, so it seemed to double the rate at which the healing was occurring. The generalized inflammation and swelling that you normally get from the surgery was just not there, which is gone. Now, some orthopedic surgeons were telling me, oh, that's going to prevent healing. You have to have swelling in order for healing to occur. But I actually believe that's wrong now based on this study 
because they put the device on right at the end of the surgery, right as before the person would even come out of the anesthesia. And so the person would wake up and they'd have this device on. Of course, they had signed a release and they would expect that. But, but right after the surgery, after they put in the sutures, they put on a dress and they put the device on, put a battery in, and it was running. So, so there didn't need to be a, heat, a, a, peri- a long period or any period of, of inflammation in order to kickstart the orthopedic tissue healer. So I believe there's a fundamental lack of knowledge in what we think about the need for inflammation. I think much of it is pathologic uh, inflammation. It just doesn't need to be there. The really compelling thing was neither of those two people were in any pain at all. And one of the two guys had actually had a surgery done the previous year, and they kind of botched it. So he was in to have that surgery fixed. And after the first surgery, they had noted in his medical chart that he was seeking drugs, like he was constantly in there for pain meds, and they were worried that this guy was just hooked on these drugs. That very same guy took one pain tablet after the surgery, and then he decided he didn't need them. He went back into his doctor and said, you know what, you did such a good job this time with this device or whatever, I don't even need these pain meds. So between both of those people, for the most painful surgery you could imagine, they took one pain tablet, and one of them was a person who had actually been noted as a potential you know, drug seeker. Uh, um, and he's just like, actually, I don't feel any pain. And then their healing was twice as fast. And the quality of the healing was maximal. It was like the, the surgeon was saying, these are beautifully healed. The incisions are healing beautifully. Everything's healing faster. It's not just that we saw it in that human study, but in the rabbit study that we did at Texas A&M, which was also a double-blind study, by the way. Um, so that the surgeons at Texas A&M didn't know which animals had had a surgically induced uh, bone gap in the ulna of the rabbit. So before when they took a piece of bone out, it's called a critical gap. It should never have healed. But when they used our device, sure enough, it healed. Incredible. In, in many cases, in most cases. But that wasn't even the most interesting result. What they told me was, they said, well, it's not really a double-blind study because the, the, the animals that have an active device – they're walking around normally, they show no signs of pain. The animals that don't have an active device, they cower in the corner and they have a lot of pain, just like you'd expect after a surgery like this. So, so the device itself was reducing the post-surgical pain tremendously, the quality of the healing. They said they could even tell in the incisions because in the animals with an active device, they get these beautiful low or no scar healing. In the animals that didn't have the device, they had a lot of swelling and a lot of scarring and the healing wasn't as fast, it wasn't as good. So we know from animal studies, we know from this one human study, we, we think we know, and it is my opinion, based upon the very limited data that we've seen, that it reduces pain after surgery, it accelerates healing, and it improves the quality of healing. It probably does all three of those things by suppressing unnecessary pathologic inflammation. So one might ask, why was why is that good, and why would any of us have pathologic, you know, hyperinflammation after an injury? Well, because we all evolved in a rainforest where the immediate threat to life was infection. So if you had a major injury, you wanted to have this massive inflammatory response from your innate immune system to just clear things out and to kill anything that might have gotten into an open wound. And that's the right response if you happen to be a proto-human four million years ago in a jungle. But now with our behavioral you know, response to injuries, we keep things clean, we clean them out, we use, we use dressings and so forth, that response is no longer helpful. Right. Where it might have protected us millions of years ago from, from infection, that's no longer the right response. And so the protection from infection has the undesirable secondary follow-on effect of inhibiting um, tissue regeneration, inhibiting um, um, you know healing, slowing it down, and also causing a lot of pain. All those things we don't need them now. You need a little bit of pain to tell you, okay, don't overuse it. But other than that, not necessary. So somebody who's like exercising, there's actually a lot of anecdotes that it's it helps endurance athletes and. The inflama- even though inflammation does help you heal, there's probably uh, a bunch of excess inflammation, or you know, that doesn't help you heal, and that helps them. So you think that that would that that could potentially? That's my help. current belief. Yeah, that's my current belief. Is that is that a, a pathologic excess inflammation has become sort of the norm, 
because it's it's built into our evolutionary history. And you know what? If you've got nothing else going for you, it at least teaches you, hey, don't do that again. You hurt yourself. Hey, stay off of that. And hey, let me get rid of whatever bugs are getting in there. But because now behaviorally, we don't have to, we don't have, like, we don't experience life or death threats every day. We have a couple of responses that are no longer good for us, like the fight or flight response, the ultra high stress response that we have to non-life threatening garbage that happens during the day, right? I mean, why should I have the response that I should have to a cave bear, okay, have that same response to somebody on a subway or something or to my boss or to, you know, one of my kids? Why should I have that response? As a modern human, I don't need that response, but it's a relic of my evolution, right? Millions of years ago, I kept some person alive long enough to reproduce, and here I am. So I'm stuck with that response. And I think the same thing is true with this inflammation, this inflammatory response in tissue. A long time ago, it was really helpful. But it stopped being helpful when we became modern humans who, who had, you know, we just weren't subjected to the same kinds of threats in the same kind of environment. And so maybe a little bit of it is good, but the rest of it is just, it's just over the top and it's too much. And the cost we pay for too much stress is that it's killing us cardiovascularly, it screws up our cognition. The cost we pay for too much inflammation is um, all of the diseases that come with adulthood and aging, right? And, and um, uh, it's it, now inflammation is viewed as as a whole suite of at the at the, at the core of a whole suite of diseases of, of aging, almost every one. Yeah, pretty much every chronic disease is, uh, has some kind of inflammation to it. Um, it's just the question is what kind. The the immune system is quite vast. There's a whole bunch of cytokines. When you see inflammation, that's right. You've got yeah. this whole bunch of stuff. So it could have been that the PEMF that I developed was suppressing some key useful mode of inflammation. And if that were the case, boy, you'd see it have negative effects on everybody right. who used it. Right. We don't see that at all. So some part of that inflammatory spectrum is being suppressed, but not so much so that there's negative consequences or we would have expected to see them, right? So I'm thinking this, and we've actually done a cytokine inflammatory panels to see oh, what signals are suppressed and which ones. So, you know, I've been thinking about this. They're very expensive to run. We've run them, and we've seen um, no effect. It's really weird. So, so no maybe this is... No cytokines. None at all. Well, it's weird. I've got the data. If you want to see it, it's like nothing. That's the it's problem. just down in the noise. Yeah, you can yeah. look at something in like uh, one level, on a very detailed level. How does it do with this cytokine, that cytokine? But then you could look on it in a systemic level and have a completely different picture. Totally different picture. And, we, and the thing yeah. is, you know, are we talking about between adjacent cells communicating something's change? Right. Are we talking about cells communicating within the same tissue or the same organ or across the body uh, exactly. over time, over distance with different chemical messengers that have different half-lives, that have different effects? We just don't know. That's, that's really interesting. And it, it's the same thing for why Why does it make me feel more awake? Who knows? There could be any number of reasons. One of the very famous people who sells these things wears it on a set every morning when he goes running for exactly the same reason that you use it. Here's my head. And he's an MD. So, see, here's the thing you got to kind of keep in mind. It's not a continuous 100 hertz. It's a very short burst at 100 hertz. It's only five or six pulses behind it. Um, so, so those might be interpreted by the brain quite differently mm. than in, that could be interpreted by the brain instead of a hundred hertz could get one hertz. That's just a, um, a repeated pulse and, and, and physiologically the body responds to, uh, small numbers of coupled pulses quite differently than it responds to a continuous stream of pulses at that frequency. So one of the things I've tried to build into it, there's, there's two things I worry about uh, one of them is something called neural accommodation. Like if you do the same stimulus over and over again, nerves will simply say, tune it out. It's just oh. sort of built into the background. If they hear the same thing monotonously, they tune it out. So that's one of the reasons that I change modes all the time. And some of these other stimulators, you can set it up at one frequency, it does one thing continuously. I would expect biologically that the effectiveness of that over time would go down to zero. It'll do something for a few minutes, and then sometimes it'll go to sort of a randomized pattern to sort of erase the memory that your mm -hmm. cells might have of what it was just doing, then go to a different thing, then go to a different mode. So the, actually, the patterns are always the same. In the different settings, all you're doing is changing how powerful the pattern is, but you're not mm -hmm. changing 
the frequencies of that pattern. So that's the only thing they're setting is the power on my device. On other people's devices, you know, you're setting all kinds of stuff, but I know that most of that doesn't work. I'm trying to focus in on a few that really do work. There was a great uh, doctoral dissertation on PEMF using quite a similar uh, pulse uh, set to what we use that showed a substantial reduction in bacterial growth when they exposed it. So it's actually bacteria cycle. What about somebody with cancer? Um, is there any now that's the other question. A bunch of people have used this device uh, in uh, concert with cancer treatment, which I advise against, by the way. I don't, I don't think a person who's got cancer should be using this. Um, but nonetheless, we've had quite a number of people use it. <coughs> One of the things that we've heard is that people who use the device after like pretty hardcore radical chemo or radio, radiation therapy is that it helps them recover very quickly. And in fact, there's a couple of companies in Asia that are interested in licensing the technology from me only for post-cancer treatment recovery. Wow. That's what they're really interested in because it allows healing to happen a lot faster. In a couple of cases, people who had you know, cancer treatment that sort of wiped out all their blood cell you know, erythropoietic mechanisms in their long bones like the femur, they would have been expected to be, there would have been a fairly prolonged period before they could actually regenerate their bone marrow. And in cases where people have used our device um, after cancer treatment on their, their femur, their physician has told them, wow, you've recovered remarkably fast. So there's some anecdotal evidence that it will help you recover after, um, after treatment from cancer. But the fact is, we just don't know. I'd love to run a study, but here's the problem with cancer. This is what I tell my students all the time. Cancer is an industry. And if I went into my kitchen and figured out how to use baking soda and Bisquick to cure cancer, the immediate effect of that would be people throwing themselves off of parking structures at every major university because cancer is an extremely well-funded, very deeply entrenched method for pumping money out of the federal government into academia. I don't know a single person doing cancer research. I don't know. I'm sure they exist. But that's really trying to cure cancer. Everyone wants to study it. It's a very, very lucrative field. So I think it's a very sick field. There have not been a lot of great advances, as far as I can tell over many, many years. Um, and so, so there's, a, there's a tremendous resistance in, from a research standpoint into really making headway on making cancer trackable. I'm certainly not saying that our device or technology helps treat cancer, but there's this whole business that's been built around it. And um, one of the things I'd love to do is, is to be able to allow people to suffer a whole lot less because some of these cancer treatments are just they're just brutal when they take you right to the brink of death and hoping that that'll kill the cancer. And then they, you know, then they bring you back. But the problem is that cancer cells are adaptive too. And if you don't kill all of them, the ones that survive will pass on their traits. So this is why after chemotherapy, you, you oftentimes see much more aggressive cancers kind of coming out. So, boy, I wish I could help people with cancer. We have some anecdotal evidence to suggest that the ISIS technology helps if you use it after cancer treatment during recovery. There are some companies who are interested in that. That's kind of all I know. Right. And yeah. I'd love to study it more. But I'm having trouble finding people who do cancer research who are interested in doing this kind of study. Yeah, no, there is a paper that shows the genes that are downregulated and the genes that are upregulated. Yes. Are there any big ones that come to mind that you're like, oh, that's interesting that that's upregulated or downregulated? When they analyzed our data for us for these NASA experiments, they said, well, yeah, there are broad classes of these genes that were related to growth that were upregulated mm -hmm. and regeneration that were upregulated. And then other broad classes of the genes that seem to be downregulated that were sort of more related to senescence and and, oh, and, and those kinds of things. I'm just going to give a whole bunch of terms. And, and if, if anything sure. sticks out, if you know if it has an effect on BDNF, um, we, um, no. no, no. Neuronal growth? Yeah. And, uh, neuronal growth? At like, uh, you know, you know, that's a tough one. Um I'd not really sure. like to know the answer sure. to that. We did see in vitro growth massively improved, increased. In neurons? The growth factors, yeah, in the normal human neural progenitor cells that we did at NASA, the growth, mm -hmm. it's just sort of the, the, um, 
genes associated with growth are up regularly really a lot, so several fold. Okay. Um, you know, way above noise. So we know that that was happening. But as far as like nerve axon growth, you know, nerve recovery, uh, uh, that's all the sort of things I want to start really studying with this spinal cord injury mm. study I'd like to do as soon as we get support for that. Okay, oxygen consumption, glucose consumption, lactate levels. So, yeah, now, now that was addressed a little bit in the NASA paper. Um, I'm not sure how much I really believe that data. That data was taken using something called an ISTAT system, which is sort of like a, a quick, you know, drop of blood, blood analysis system. Um, uh, you know, you're talking about these sort of met metabolic uh, markers. Um, don't know the answer to that, but once again, that's something that nowadays I think we could do a, a really, that, that's an experiment that would be relatively easy to do. If someone's interested in doing that sort of thing, I'd be delighted to collaborate and pay for the technology side of it. The, the, um, my recollection from the NASA paper, as he reported it, was that the changes in oxygen consumption, lactate, and so forth, were uh, maybe there, but it wasn't very impressive. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah, and that's, what about that's... calcium channels? Because those are very important. Now, well. that's an excellent question. That is the that is the focus of the two ongoing collaborations mm -hmm. that I've started, uh, both of them in Texas, both of them with with prominent laboratories that do calcium signaling. Um, uh, they're both trying to ramp up to do these experiments. Maybe in a couple months I'll actually be able to... If this is so effective, why is it not insanely popular? Um, in general, what do you have to say to the skeptics? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question, and, and my answer to that is that, first of all, it's pretty new. Right, okay. So, uh, secondly, I haven't spent, you know, dollar one marketing the thing. It's still experimental. Um, you know, it, it costs money. We know the best thing that you can, you know, the best, if you could put it in a pillow, the best thing for you would be yoga. You know, um, why isn't it that wildly popular? Well, it's becoming wildly popular. People are, people do, you know, there are doctors who've said, you know, if you could put yoga in a pill, it would be the best selling drug. Right. But it takes effort and it takes time. Money. Um, why, is, why is this thing not wildly popular? Well, my vision is for it to become wildly popular and to do so not at the expense of abusing people for many, many years. But you have to understand I'm not doing this in academia because academia is, is, is damaged. I'm doing this with some federal funding, um, but I'm doing it on my own terms. I'm also doing I'm funding it out of my own pocket. Mm. Uh, every time that I've tried to work with, with people who have some resources, there have been some problems. Um, just so you know, there have been five different people who have claimed to have invented this that are not me. There are actually patents filed to at least three different people who have patented work that I've done. So the patents, of course, are invalid. They've never stand the test in court. But there's so much greed and avarice out there. What I've decided to do is do this under the radar and really figure it out, working with sponsors in the military, trying to work with the FDA to the extent that they're helpful. And they can be very helpful, by the way, if you, if you know how to work with them, uh, to try to get this technology developed. I'm not taking investment because every single investor that I talk to um, wants to grab control of the thing, squeeze as much money as they can out of it. They want to use the standard model that you use for pharmaceuticals, mm. which I'm not going to. I'm not going to sign, you know, uh, this over to Satan and let that get taken away. I, I'm maintaining control of it so I can essentially give it away right. when I need to. Right now is not the time because if I did that, if I made it public right now, there'd be tons of pirates. People would make sort of substandard stuff. They wouldn't understand it. They wouldn't be able to, they wouldn't do all the things that I do to make sure it's working. It would be this weird Wild West free for all. So I'm a little bit, um, that's the only reason that I'm a little bit protective of it is that I don't want people to, to go out and, and screw it up. Because I just don't have the horsepower to prevent that from happening. So, I, so I, I'm cautious. I'm really cautious. I don't want anybody to get hurt. I don't want people to lose a lot of money buying snake oil cures. And so when you factor that in with the fact that the system for getting something approved um, and where you can, you know, what the FDA regulates, the FDA regulates 
labeling in interstate commerce in the United States. So what that what labeling is, there's a specific legal definition, and that means anything you can say about your product that you'd find like in a press release, in marketing material, on a label, on an insert, on your web page. So if you say, you know, my drug is intended to cure, diagnose, treat, or prevent something. Those are controlled words. You can't say it cures, diagnoses, prevents, or treats. That's why when you, when you pick up a nutraceutical, there's a little box on there that says not intended to treat, diagnose, prevent, or cure any disease. Because they're saying explicitly, we are not encroaching on what is, what is regulated by the FDA. So the answer to that question is very long. It's very complicated. Part of it is, I am not, my, my First Amendment rights under the U.S. Constitution are violated by federal law. I am unable to say what I personally and professionally believe to be true about the technology. And those laws are in place to protect the public from people who would be happy to lie and say, hey, my stuff cures cancer. Hey, my stuff does this and that. And, and people who are desperate will become victims. So we have to kind of trade off our First Amendment rights to speak the truth when it comes to medical devices and, and drugs. And this is an ongoing debate. There's the FDA pendulum is always swinging you know, back and forth, more permissive, less permissive. Right now they're in a very sort of not permissive phase and have been for many years. So the cost, the cost is that people like me are unable to just get on a web page and say, here's my scientific data. This is what it, it does. Because unfortunately, scientific data can be falsified. People can run the same study six times, cherry pick the data they want, put it on a graph, and start selling stuff. So the FDA does a very important function by preventing that. Unfortunately, when you squelch the voice of all the liars and charlatans, you also squelch the voice of the people who are speaking the truth. So our society has decided that when it comes to political dissent, everyone has a right to free speech. When it comes to medical treatment, nobody has a right to free speech. None. That's, that's what we are legally. And that's why it's not wildly popular because you can't say anything about it. How much would it cost uh, to get this thing like FDA approved? That's an interesting question. Um, the short answer is it really depends. When you say FDA approved, you're not just saying it's approved for everything. Right. Every approval from the FDA comes with a specific set of medical claims. So each set of medical claims requires an approval. So say I were to say, hypothetically, it treats chronic pain, which is a really big problem. That's one out of every three adults around the world. Chronic pain is bigger than if you combine cancer, stroke, cardiovascular disease, and diabetes. You put all four of those together, multiply by two, that's the number of people who suffer from chronic pain. So it's a big deal. So having that medical claim is a big deal. Say I was able to do that, um, hypothetically. That would be the one medical claim for chronic pain. To say that it's healing something, to say that it's correcting or preventing something, these are all different medical claims, each of which requires approval. If I get FDA approval, that doesn't mean I can just sell it. That means that I can say that on a labeling, but the FDA may require, hey, this is by prescription only. You can only use it for these specific indications. As far as I know, all the FDA-approved PEMF devices are very tightly restricted in how they may be used by their, by their approval. Some of them are by prescription only, only under these very limited things. So FDA approval is not a panacea. In fact, it can prevent devices and drugs from being used for other things. So first of all, that's, that's just the case. It doesn't make everything good. Secondly, FDA approval is supposed to assure the safety and efficacy of those things that are FDA approved. However, anyone with an internet connection can prove to themselves satisfactorily that FDA approval is no assurance of safety. It is no assurance of efficacy or any. Right. So that part of the system is broken. Now, with it being that broken, let's look at what it costs, right? I've had my technology independently assessed. If everything went perfectly, absolutely perfectly, I could get it maybe approved for one medical claim for $5 million in about five years. Oh, wow. That's the minimum. 
people who've actually tried to do this with PEMF devices have been faced with, so far as I know, up to $180 million in at least six years worth of studies. Now, you can spend all that, and there's no guarantee. You can go ahead and spend all that. There's no guarantee that your study will show what you expect it to show. I, I think ours would because so much good data. But say it does show what you expect it to show. The FDA does not have to accept any data if they just simply believe that you're not representing that data accurately, they can say, you know what, we don't believe you. It doesn't matter how carefully done your study was. And there are many devices and medications that are not FDA approved, largely because the FDA kind of didn't believe their, their data. So you could, you could write the check, you could take the time, you could do that. Here's the other problem with FDA approval. And this has happened to at least two companies that have approved PMF devices. Say you get your device approved. Right, you can go ahead and sell it into this really narrow market. Like the ones that I know that are approved are for like uh, non-union fractures, right? Very, very, very small. So less than 1% of the people who can benefit from picking up. Say you improve the technology. Wow, it's a little bit better. Let's go ahead and put that into our new device. <clears throat> FDA will chop you off. Nope, you got to go back and rerun all of your studies. So every improvement requires oh, wow. this. You pay the check again, you run the study. So imagine your iPhone. Imagine any of your tech. Imagine that they had to put a five-year, you know, and drugs are even more expensive. They're averaging now billions of dollars per drug. Imagine, you know, you know that operating system update? You can't do that. So you've got to go through five years of study, make sure that it's not going to cause anybody any anxiety, that that operating system is better. So, so you know, it's so tightly regulated that what happens is that you get no innovation. So the primary reason that I have not really aggressively received FDA approval is that I would rather innovate. And because I'm not really, I'm, I'm not beholden to anybody, I'm not worried about making a lot of money on it, I would just rather try to come up with a system where we can crowdsource research and innovation and really just drive the technology forward. Because as soon as you get an FDA approved, it's like it's frozen on a block of ice and you just can't innovate anymore without paying an outrageous amount of money, tremendous I mean, millions, it could be hundreds of millions of dollars, and spending years and years and years to make each incremental improvement. If that's the way, if computers were regulated the same way that medical devices are currently regulated, we would not even have pawn. We would have nothing. There would be nothing. In, in the 21st century, we're really concerned with safety. Everything's got to be really safe. But the trade off well, is. Be. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's can good. Be. But the trade-off is when you regulate that safety to an extreme level, then you stifle in innovation. That's what well, not only, not only do you, do you do it to an extreme level, but here's what's going to get me in trouble when I say this. You know, regulation can cause great harm. It can cause tremendous amounts of harm by making life-saving technologies unavailable, unavailable to people. Yeah. Right. So, so, and a great example of this is Mela Technologies, and I'm saying I'm referring to them in a very positive way. They're the ones who came up with this way to use a camera to diagnose uh, melanoma. It just as a camera takes a picture and it says, "Hey, you know what? You need to look at that little thing a little bit more. It's got all the characteristics of the melanoma." And the FDA absolutely just just blackballed that. And you can read all about it. There's a book written about it by this former CEO. And 8,000 people a year die of melanoma in the United States. And you could make a, and, and it's been delayed now for years and years and years. And it's non invasive. They take a picture of a mole and they tell you whether or not you should biopsy it. And it's like 98% accurate. It's been shown over and over again. So, so you could argue that, that in the interest of, pre, of preventing someone from being harmed by taking a photograph, that could only, in the worst case, lead to a biopsy. And, and it doesn't even say you must take a bias up to the dermatologist. So it's just one extra tool for a dermatologist. It's been delayed for like a decade, okay? 80,000 people had to die? Where's the safety in that? Interesting. Explain uh, that to me. And that's true yeah. for everything. You extend that out to every possible thing. So the, the safety trade-off is, is it safer to let people try and use something? Or is it safer to just say no all the time. So the only safety that's garnered from that kind of from from that kind of policy is that the FDA saves itself from 
the 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 risk of approving something that turns out not to work. Right. Um, now, the question is: it, somebody had this question. If you put it on one place, does the healing effects or whatever the effect it has, does it travel throughout the body, and could it affect? Uh, the weird thing that we see, and this is this is me. Um, it's a really interesting thing. I'm not going to use the word healing. Let's just say it sort of makes things better. Okay? Yeah. What we tend to see is that inflammation goes from being focal to being systemic. Mm -hmm. Right? So if you have something that causes inflammation in one area, there seems to be a signal that sort of rolls out to your whole body and over time causes problems in many other places. That's a whole discussion we can talk about. Some people would say, you have no evidence for that. But sort of we know... Just people know, you know, that can happen. You start to have a problem in one place, and then all of a sudden you start to... And there are whole like, classes of diseases that seem to work this way, that move around the body once you have certain types of injuries. So, it seems to make sense that if you can suppress the source of inflammation in one place, that may have an overall systemic benefit, right? When people tell me about their experience with... ISIS technology. That's what I hear. But Whether or not that's what's happening, I don't know. Right. But I, but I think that in that case, yeah. No, but let's say, um, so that's 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 a very good answer, but let's say, uh, do you are you aware of any mechanism where it can travel throughout the body? Um, if you yeah, put, sure. Oh, so it can sure, travel. Sure, sure, absolutely. So circulating cytokines and that sort of a thing. So say inflammation is the result of a certain set of signals, and some of those signals circulate, and they go far away, and they go to other tissues and it says, hey, inflammation, inflammation. So you get the spillover effect. There's no reason to think that the counter signal isn't also circulating no. signal. Yeah, but let's say the uh, induction. Does that induction have an effect? Does it like in any way travel through the blood maybe? That kind of thing? No, yeah. I don't think so. Oh, okay. I, think it's, I, think it's, I think it's pretty prosaic actually. Mm -hmm. I, think it's, I, I think it's kind of simple. It says, well, okay, we're getting this electromagnetic induction. It is... You know, thinking of the body as a state machine, so it tends to want to be in this state or this state, or a state of, of growth and, or a state of degeneration, a state of health or a state of illness. And your whole body is affected by things that happen in distant parts, okay? Now, whether the electromagnetic field is sort of traveling somehow magically through your body, I guess would be no. Um, but it, 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 how is it affecting distant areas in the body? Probably by... By correcting the or changing the state of a, of a local area of tissues to one that's sending out a different signal. And so it's competing with other signals, right, in your body. Now, if that area you're treating happened to have been sending out a negative signal, and now you change that to a positive signal, it's not only is it not competing necessarily with that negative signal that's been changed, but it's also sending out this positive anti-inflammatory signal, and then you get this overall systemic, you know, reduction Mm -hmm. That seems to make sense to me. I can't prove it, but that would be my that would be my what I think is happening. Okay. What do you do about the uh, batteries? Do you have rechargeables because they run out. Yeah, actually, I use a specific type of nine volt rechargeable that you can buy from Amazon.com. Unfortunately, when you know it, right after I released this product, a new a new uh, a type of uh, battery came available, and they were cheaper with the ion batteries, but they're too big. They're actually larger than the standard size and novel for 9-volt batteries, so they don't fit into our system. They have sort of like, they're blue and silver. I wouldn't buy those because they don't really fit into our system. The ones that we recommend are maximal power, which you can get on Amazon, and I optimized the system to run really long on those, and I've taken actually a lot of data showing like how long the system will run on different settings using different kinds of batteries. It'll work just fine using a 9-volt alkaline battery, pretty much any one that you can buy. Okay. But also you can buy rechargeable nickel metal hydride. Those all basically fit, and you can buy rechargeable lithium ion, but you want to make sure you buy the right ones, not the oversized ones. Okay, and a lot of people are asking me, how do you put it on? Um, so I actually, I mean, I use... I use this. Let me see some. Um, That's the right stuff. Yeah. yeah. Have you seen? I have on YouTube. Have you seen my tutorials for that? Yeah, I saw your video, so I actually posted that that tutorial. Um, that but, seems to help a bunch of people, but you know, for some reason, they're still asking the questions. <laughs> they're still asking the question. So, so some people have asked me a more general question that's a little bit more um, cynical, right? So the question is, why the hell is this thing so hard to use? 
Um, and the answer is it's hard to use because the physics is real, right? If it was a placebo, I would just say, put it in your refrigerator, put it in your, put it in your shelf, and it'll work great, you know? And it would work great for the placebo effect. Oh, the magnetic fields will go through the ether and they'll, they'll help you. But, because, but it, we, don't, we can't say that because the physics of how ISIS works is actually really real. The physics is something that's been known for over 150 years. So the interesting thing that we find is when a person uses the coils wrong, when they place them wrongly, it actually doesn't work at all. And I get these scathing emails, oh, this thing doesn't work, blah, 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 blah. Even the guy who runs the Illegal Wave website, who sells it as an Illegal Wave, he uh, first used it and said, oh, it doesn't work at all, didn't help anything. And then I said, well, tell me how you, where you place the coils. And he placed them too far apart in the wrong orientation. I said, well, why don't you try this? Place them together, put them both, you know, bumpy side out, try that for a while, tell me if it works. And he called me back the next day. He's like, oh my God, this works really, really well. Can I sell these things for you? Blah, blah, blah. So if you use it wrong, if you place the coils wrong, it's physics. It will just not work because you're not, you're not placing it correctly. So it's worth taking the time to think about how to place them. And the, and the simplest way to place them is either stacking them bumps to bumps and wrapping this coil that, that Joseph's got, um, this, uh, this, this self-adherent bandage around him. That holds it really well. We're placing them side by side in like a figure eight, bumps facing the same way, and wrapping that self-adherent uh, bandage around it, and then it holds them in place. And what I do is I tend to, and you can see this on the videos, but I tend to use them looking just like this. And this is the two coils side by side, some of that green, you might have even seen this one on the video. This is one I use on my lower back. And I just put it across my spine like that. And the bumps are on the same side, you know, and you can feel which side it is, and you just, you know, put it there. Um, so that's the easiest way to place them. And you want to put it so, obviously um, um, that the bumps aren't touching your skin, the flat side. Yeah, bumps away from your skin yeah. in every application. Um, if you either put the coils on the opposite side of the injury, so the injury is between them, or you put the coils side by side, like an infinity sign or a figure eight, and and then put that right over the injury if it's a little closer to the surface. So, yeah. Um, yeah. This is how I, I actually use it. I'm going to look ridiculous, so I don't go outside like this, but... I put like this. Tell me if this is good. That's why I'm doing this. That's um, awesome. Can I, can I use that as a screensaver? <laughs> so I, I'll put it like this. That's if I want to use it on my head, I'll put it like this. That would work really. Yeah, that's that's right. I mean, the coils are, as far as placing them in a location on your head, that's, I would have to speculate, but I mean, depending on what you're right, trying well, to do. Yeah, no, I'm actually trying to target my hypothalamus. <laughs> are you? Okay. Yeah, um, so then, and, and if I want to put it like this, I could put it like this. Yeah. And then yeah. I could, uh, and then if I want to put it in back of my head, and so I'll do that in a few different sp uh, places. And if I want to put it on back of my head, I look like Rambo. Um, yeah, exactly. And so I go like this. So maybe you can turn your head so we can all see it. Yeah. Like. This. Can you see it? Or. Yes, I can see it very clearly. Um. So yeah, that's um. Is yeah, that stacking that them together like that, bumps to bumps. That's the right way to do it. If you do it bump to smooth side, the two fields will cancel, and you'll get nothing. Right, so this is uh, not a bad way to, to put it on, right? Just As far as the physics of the coil orientation, that's right on. That's yeah, exactly yeah, right. okay. The other way would be to put it on opposite sides, you know, so that you yeah. get it closed, bumps out, and, and some people do that. Uh, some people do it front of the head and base of the skull. Some people will do it as a figure eight at the base of the skull. Right. That's what people tell me. Yeah, no, yeah. I'm I'm still experimenting with exactly how I want to do it right now. I I happen to have good effects from that, and um, it's a little more convenient because when you got to put it on two sides, one of them can fold down more easily. Um, it's just a little more convenient like that, and I find that it works pretty well. So let's see what else we got here. Um, how long do you keep it on your own injury? I mean, or and and I and, tend and to wear it all goes. day. Like, you I don't actually have to wear it anymore because my back has gotten so much better. So I put it on when I get up, and I'll wear it around all day for 10 or 12 hours, something like that. Oh, wow. Um, some people wear it all night. Like, they'll, they'll actually get a back brace or something, carve out some of the foam, embed the coils, and then just put it in there all night. Some people will put it into, like, an ace bandage and just sort of have the coils hanging around and put the thing on their bed and use it all night. Um, it's such a low-energy thing, and the mechanism seems to be suppressing inflammation pretty well. It's, you know, I don't, I don't think you run a risk of having too much, but I don't know. And I use it all day, every day for like five years. How does someone know which setting to use it on? So you got four different settings. You know what? I would say I, it, it's sort of, there's a, there's a 
concept called titration, right? Like you just sort of try it and see, and if it's enough, you leave it there, and if it's not enough, you bump it up a little bit. So my recommendation if a person's experimenting with it is, you know, start out on like a medium setting. If you feel discomfort or something, move the coils into a different orientation. Like I feel discomfort if I place coils oriented like this over my spine. I made this really cool like array of coils that would go up along the spine. I thought it would be really awesome and everything from my back. Put it on, and it, it just made me feel bad, you know. And when I put them on like this, it hurts. Put them on like this, it was right. right. So there's a certain amount of, you know, experiment a little bit. If, you, if it doesn't feel right, don't do that, right? right. And then, and then there's a certain amount of, you know, less is more. Actually, after using it for five years every day, I still use the thing on a medium setting. I used to use it on a high setting to get the pain reduction effect. But then I, I, it was good, and I was good. And so I would go down to medium, and that was enough. I'd go down to low. That was usually enough. Some days I needed a little bit more. So, so use the least amount that gives you the – beneficial effect that you're looking for don't 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 be excessive i don't think you have to overdose but some people actually really benefit more from a higher setting and, and i always ask them you know does it work as well for you on a lower setting and usually those people say, yeah, yeah 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 it's so 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 this is one of those things i just i don't know how to make it much simpler than it is mm -hmm. um and as you know very well joseph there's just one size does not fit all. So rather than making the mistake of making it completely like, you know, childproof, you know, scissors and you can't hurt yourself but you can't cut paper with it, I've opted to make the system a little bit more flexible. I haven't put a lot of dials on there where people can change their frequencies to do things that I'm, I've already tested and I know won't work. So I try to give everybody the optimal, try to give everybody the optimal sort of parameter set. And then the two things that you can really change yourself uh, where you place the coils, which are going to vary from person to person, injury to injury, and how much intensity you put into, you know, how much power you put into the output, which also people have different levels of sensitivity. So for an injury that just happened that's got a big, you know, inflammatory response, a higher setting, like if I wipe out on my bike or something, man, I slap it on there, crank it up, and, and many people who have athletic injuries that are acute, they tell me that really, really works well. For something that's chronic for a long period of time, Turn, I'll dial it down some, and you still have to experiment with where the coils are placed. That's not because this is snake oil, and I'm trying to sort of like lead you down a path to keep you busy. Yeah, that's actually what you need to do. You need to. You need. It's just sort of like putting a bandage on yourself, right? Sometimes you wrap the bandage, and you're like, "Wow, that works really well." Other times, you're like, "Yeah, that wasn't quite what I needed." It's sort of like that. You have to. You have to invest enough attention into the thing to get the benefit. So it's more complicated than just pop and fill. Interesting. And what do, um, you sent me another device that I've only been able to use once because I ran out of batteries and I was waiting for the rechargeables. Right. Um, so what, I mean, but I, but the time that I did use it, it seemed much more, um, much less stimulating. Um, well, it should have, it should have because the device that I sent you is optimized for sort of Delta wave mm -hmm. kind of stuff. And so you should, you know, if there's any kind of, cortical entrainment resulting from the device, that should be the response that you get, would be much less stimulatory, much more sort of delta wave, brainwave kind of thing. Um, that may not be what you want, but I mean, if you want me to keep, you know, you can just send the thing back to me, I'll retweak it, tell you what it's doing, I'll send you an email, I'll tell you what it's, what it's doing, but I want you to play with it first and sort of decide what it's doing for you, and then you can try a bunch of different things and, you know, decide what you like the best. Yeah, that's that's exactly what I'm gonna do, and I want to try that out more and see. You know, maybe yeah. I'm gonna have. To, I don't really get anxious anymore, but if I do, I'm going to try to see how it works for that. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I'm happy to work with you on this because I would like to know. You know, um, we have almost no information about people's you know states of heightened awareness and cognitive states. So the more that we know about that, the better. Of course, you know, all the standard cautionary notes. I don't know if it's harmful or not on the brain. I can tell you there are FDA-approved, you know, magnetic pulsing devices that are many, many, many times more powerful that are FDA-approved. They're so powerful that if you put them over, like, your speech centers, it'll actually cause your speech to be slurred. That's how powerful these things are. I would never put one on my head. But the device that we're selling is much more nuanced, much more subtle than that. Using the same basic sort of frequency regime, so it's hard for me to imagine that it would be harmful. 
But then on the other hand, some people are wearing it for many hours. So you want to be cautious, right? That being said, the only way to find out about these things is for people to, you know, who are interested, yeah, yeah. Who, who, who take my, my statements at face value. You're willing to, willing to try it. You're one of those people. So I really want to hear what happens, especially if it's not positive. Okay. Right? Um, and here's uh, one reader asked, um, named Sean, why do the coils need to be replaced every three months? So it's kind of like um, it's something that can come in contact with your body. The, the, the materials are the highest quality that we can get. The gray rubber parts are medical grade. They're actually made by, by a chemical company in the United States that makes medical grade thermoplastic elastomer. But they are a little bit absorbent. They do absorb oils and stuff like that. So it's kind of like your toothbrush, right? Could you make a toothbrush that lasted forever? Sure you could. You know, titanium, you know, bristles and, you know, tool steel handle and everything. But you're better off using something like that, using it up and replacing it. So our goal was to make the cost very reasonable. Everybody wants to sell these coils for, you know, 50 bucks or something. We sell them very expensively on our website. We're going to drop that price as soon as we can. We're basically selling that cost. Like what it costs me to have them made and shipped to me, shipped to whoever's buying it, that's what I charge. So I'm not trying to make any more money on the coils. So if I were to make the coils more durable, they have to be heavier and thicker and harder to use. Mm -hmm. So there's an engineering trade-off. It's an engineering trade-off between durability and convenience. I mean, if you wanted me to make these coils so they were bulletproof, I could. They could have like, you know, multiple stainless steel cladding on the outside. You could shoot a millimeter out and the bullet would bounce off but they weigh like 15 pounds, right? No. I think the right answer is when I look, when I, because I've tried a whole range of different coil, you know, thicknesses and sizes and everything. What I think the, the reason is that, that they wear out after a month or two of continuous use, and, and there are people who use them for more than a year. I personally will physically break them after about five or six weeks. Uh, some people use other things and they kind of get in, the oils get in and they make the rubber hard and stuff like that. It just seems to me it's like a toothbrush. It's something you want to replace every month or two. Honestly, I'd probably use my toothbrush for three or four months. Probably shouldn't. But they're designed to last for about a month. And, it's, and so I can't speak for toothbrushes, but in my case, I can tell you, I'm not trying to make money off the coils. You know, I'm trying to make them give you the best value for the dollar. And that's why I give you this, we actually added it for free, that little hexagonal coil tester that you get with the system, so that you know that the coils are still working. But it is a piece of wire, and people like who are very active are going to flex it a lot. If the wire breaks internally, I want you to know, hey, here's a problem, time to replace those coils. So, you know, so it's, it's like, you can make them last longer, but they cost more, they'd be heavier. If the coils are, uh, if they're still working on that testing device that, you, you, that comes mm -hmm. with it, then it's still fine to use? Yeah, absolutely. Now, the only caveat to that is that sometimes the broken wires will go together and then not go together. If you see that device, it sort of works sometimes and then doesn't work sometimes, especially if you jiggle the wire. That means the wire's broken and you've got intermittent contact, and then it's time to replace the coils. Because, you know, it's not that expensive. I know, I know it costs money, right? But, I mean, I'm, get, I'm giving them out at what it costs me to make them. Um, this is one of the reasons why the DIY PMF guys have picked them up because I'm not making money on these things. I mean, they're getting them. You know, if you were to buy the parts to make this yourself, it would cost you twice as much. I can tell you that if you went to a radio shack and bought the parts. 